happening. There are some people that are still culturally drawn to Christianity. Like some of these big public conversions recently have been conversions that we might have questions about. Like it was you being drawn to conservative politics and you became a Christian along the way, or this idea of Western civilization and you became a Christian along the way. And we might have appropriate questions or concerns about that. But there's also a lot of stories he's telling of people going, the, a version of a, a story about the world that says there's nothing beyond just the violence and chaos and meaninglessness of this is not an appealing story. And when someone tells me, hey, actually, there's this really beautiful story about your value as a human being and the coming redemption of all things and the goodness of creation, that's an appealing story. The stories that evangelicalism and fundamentalism told were stories they told to a world that already believed some version of that, that there's something meaningful, that there's some kind of God. They had to tell something in addition to that to get you to come to their church or to change traditions or move denominations or whatever. I do think to be a little annoyingly hopeful, I do think we're entering an era where just the plain story of you are valuable, creation is good. Yes, it is broken now and you are sinful now, but Mm -hmm. a good merciful God is coming back to redeem all things and restore all things is no longer just sort of like the general message swimming or that we're swimming around in. That's a really striking message. And I worry that many of us in the evangelical camp and in the ex-evangelical camp and in the mainline churches and across you know, many Christian traditions and denominations still think we need to add something to that story and are forgetting that that is becoming both a really surprising story and a more plausible story. Like people are starting to give up on a purely materialistic view of the world. There are people right, in my right. city. I mean, down the street from my church is a store that just sells crystals and Ouija boards and like a lot of weird stuff. And it's not seen as demonic or strange or it's just like, of course, people believe weird things. And it reminds me of, you know, a couple of years ago, I had coffee with a professor, an atheist professor, a historian of of Christianity who was starting to consider becoming a Christian. And she was starting to consider this in an evangelical megachurch, which was so strange to me. I thought, you know, a well-educated, respectable professor, you're going to go find a respectable form of Christianity, not this giant lights and smoke evangelical megachurch. And the way she described what was appealing to her as someone who knows Every skeleton in the closet. She's a historian of evangelicalism. She knows what is really Mm -hmm. broken in evangelicalism. What was appealing to her was she showed up at a church and she was like, these people actually seem to believe that Jesus Christ was a real person who died on the cross and rose from the dead. And that is both a a claim I want to verify as a historian Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. a wild claim for people to genuinely believe. So again, to be like annoyingly (laughs) naive about this, but I just think... If we're the kind of people walking around the world actually genuinely believing such a wild and beautiful claim, there is something appealing about that in a new way now. It's always been appealing. It's always been a beautiful story. But I don't want us to discount how some of these changes, while it might make the fear-based approach really not appealing, it might make the therapeutic approach not very appealing I think it's always been appealing, but I think it's especially appealing now to say you're starting to believe there's more to the world than just this material world. Let me tell you a really beautiful story about what is going on that's more than just this material world. Yeah. Uh, to, to piggyback off of that, when you read this article about this ex-evangelical book and and Sarah McCammon's, that her name, Sarah McCammon's story, like McCammon, McCannon, McCammon, uh, like what she documents are some genuinely terrible experiences from yeah. the abuse of her parents to the the purity culture shaming that she went through to all this other nonsense the fear over rapture and all that stuff and yet as terrible as those things may be as as regretful as they may be if jesus christ has risen from the dead then on some level that those experiences don't justify abandoning your faith there, there are good reasons to critique the church you grew up mm-hmm. in or to critique the subculture you were a part of, but it's not a good enough reason to walk away from the truth of the gospel. And I think that's when I encounter these evangelical stories, I'm always torn about them because on the one hand, I feel like, oh, it's tragic that their Christian community was not more aligned with Jesus and his kingdom mm-hmm. in the way this young person was cared for and loved and taught and nurtured in the faith. That I grieve deeply. But it still doesn't change the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And therefore, I want to sit down with this person and both empathize with their story 
and then show them that there's something better than what they've experienced. Mm -hmm. Don't mm -hmm. give up. I mean, that's part of why I'm still here. I, yeah. I, regardless of what I've experienced in the church or what I've seen Christians do good or bad, yeah, I want them to be more faithful representatives of the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, but that doesn't change the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah. And we mm -hmm. got to keep coming back to that. And I feel like that never really gets addressed in these kinds of stories. Right. Okay. I want to, I want to piggyback on something Caitlin said about telling a, a bigger story or a, a more beautiful story. Because it feels like, and I don't know if this goes back a thousand years or just like a couple hundred years, or if it's really just like the second great awakening when we started doing this, but we really started telling the story from Genesis 3. We started mm -hmm. in Genesis 3 with the fall, and we end, you know, two chapters before the end of Revelation with judgment. So we tell the story, we tell a story that starts with fall and ends with judgment. And that's a scary story and a motivating story if you already accept all the premises underlying it. Mm -hmm. If you don't accept the premises, it's a very easy story to ignore. It's just like, well, that, why would I want that to be true? That's mm -hmm. terrible. Um, when you start Genesis 1 with, new, with creation and you end with new creation, you're telling a completely different story. You know, the story isn't about you. It's not about how bad you are and how badly you've messed up. And maybe there's a chance for you to be okay and not burn forever. Maybe there isn't. Um, but it's a completely different story of a good God who made a good creation and then invited us to be a part of expanding that good creation. And then here's what went wrong and here's what God did about it. But we're still going to end up exactly where God wants us to end up, which is new creation you know, and joining him in it. So I'm, I'm just wondering if, if the baggage, you know, kind of the fundamentalist baggage in, in American evangelicalism is partly why a lot of people who, who are rejecting the fundamentalist aspect but don't want to reject Jesus, you know, are becoming evangelical Anglicans and, you know, are looking more to British evangelicalism and, and different forms of evangelicalism that don't have the baggage of the modernist fundamentalist controversy and the isolationism that developed. Huh? That's a pretty good theory, huh? Can I, I like it. I, yeah, I mean, okay. I remember my first semester of seminary, my first week of seminary, probably, we, we all had to take a spiritual formation class our first semester. And the first couple lectures were all about this picture from Genesis to Revelation. And the professor said something very similar to what you just said, Phil, of like, our anthropology cannot start in Genesis 3. It needs to start in Genesis 1. And the story he told of this like beautiful creation to redemption story, I remember thinking, I have grown up in the church my whole life. I have never heard that. I remember mm -hmm. <laughs> being in high school and asking a youth leader, what about new heavens and new earth kind of situation? And she was like, oh, that's not in the Bible. Where'd you hear that? And now I feel sympathy for her because I think she was probably 16 and I was nine. And, you know, why why was anyone putting her in, in authority over me? Like, that was terrible. But but it I do think it's not only important to say this is a more desirable story. This is a more beautiful story. This is a more true story, but also it not only gives us greater hope for eternity, but it changes the the meaningfulness and value of life here and now and the work we're doing here and now. And I think part of what we got really wrong in the past was not just telling the gospel wrong, but then saying, all that matters then is you go around and turn and say that, that same gospel to other people because everything else you do is kind of ultimately worthless. Right. Instead, now it's like, right. you're a social worker? That's amazing. That's you providing glimpses of the coming kingdom of God, and that work will be perfected and continue into eternity. If you're an architect, if you're a doctor, if you're, I don't know about podcasts and eternity, but whatever it is that you do, there will be a way in which, if that is faithfully done by the power of the Holy Spirit, that continues into eternity. And that feels a lot more hopeful than just the either avoiding damnation or even like the vision I had, which was like, we're sitting on a cloud singing and mostly mm -hmm. being bored. It's like, no, work now is meaningful, and the parts of it that are hard now won't exist forever. They will be redeemed. Um, Caitlin, 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 one follow-up question. Will news of the butt carry on into eternity? We might disagree about that, Phil, because I feel like that might be uh, one of those things that has to be purged. Phil, it, no, it will be redeemed and perfected. Whoa!